Welcome to this episode of Reflections, the Wisdom of Edgar Cayce. Today we have two guests, Dr. Eben Alexander, the Harvard neurosurgeon whose near-death experience he wrote about in the best-selling book, Proof of Heaven. He and Karen Newell, our other guest, have co-written a book titled Living in a Mindful Universe, which is in a way the follow-up to the experience that Dr. Alexander had in his near-death experience. Karen Newell, who's also joining us, has created a technique titled Sacred Acoustics, which helps guide people into the spirit realm. So you no longer need a near-death experience to visit heaven. So join me as we meet with Dr. Alexander and Karen Newell. Okay, so Evan and Karen, thank you for uh, joining us on uh, this episode of Reflections. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Peter, it's great to be here. Thanks for having us on. Yes, sure. thank you so much. Sure thing. And um, maybe we can start with um, what is it, uh, the work that you do together? How does that, how did you uh, kind of find each other and how, how have you found that the, uh, the experiences that you've had have weaved together in the ways that they have? Well, we first met in November of 2011 when uh, I was three years out from my coma. I was you know, deeply mystified by much of my journey of trying to understand the nature of the brain-mind relationship and nature of consciousness because my uh, coma journey, as reported in the book Proof of Heaven, completely violated everything I thought I knew. And I had come to realize that exploring consciousness was absolutely mandatory if we're going to have any understanding of it. So I was beginning a very active program of meditation. Uh, and in that, I had uh, encountered this notion of binaural beats, which is actually a profound kind of different way of processing uh, sound that, that the brain uses with a very ancient uh, circuit. And so I was using that kind of technology, and that's exactly where I ran into Karen, because in fact, uh, she had spent uh, a lifetime really pursuing some of these deep truths. And uh, she was on a pathway that I realized was way ahead of me in many ways, but one that uh, held many answers. And that's yeah. why um, we ended up getting together and doing a lot of this work. And Karen, you can- Yeah, so up until the point that Evan and I met, I had spent about a year with another individual, Kevin Cossey, creating our own sound recordings. Mm. We, we uh, had, I had gathered a large library of all kinds of brainwave entrainment technology. This is audio recordings that contain what Evan said, these binaural beats. Mm -hmm. And Kevin and I were very busy creating our own binaural beats to have what we called sound journeys, where we would use our own intention to kind of connect with something greater for some purpose, whether it was to gather information or to release an emotional blockage or, you know, find out our purpose in life, so those mm -hmm. sorts of things. And so it was fascinating when we met Eben because we then invited him to listen to these sounds. And one of the things he told us is that he was able to reconnect with the uh, experience he had while in coma and uh, his near-death experience he was able to encounter these realms greater than ours here in the physical world and our sound helped him to do a very similar thing oh that's great i mean i sometimes i'll say you know as wonderful as near-death experiences are i don't recommend that you try them so it's okay. it's nice that you found a uh, another way uh, kind of using, I guess it's, it's uh, with binaural beats, it's kind of using, is it sound or kind of waves that kind of, the brain starts to match the, the brain waves and gets you into these altered states which are similar to what you experienced in the coma? Well, I'll tell you the re, the re, that yes, they are audio recordings and binaural beats are basically at their very most basic. It's when you play one frequency in one ear, say 100 hertz, and a slightly different frequency in the other year, for example, 104 hertz. Mm -hmm. And it's that difference between the two, that four hertz, that's the example I'm using, that, that is equivalent to a lower brainwave state. And four hertz happens to be that border between delta and theta, that border between asleep and awake. Uh. And this hypnagogic state, kind of these, these tones help people to get into this hypnagogic state, this more vibrational state. I know Edgar Casey talks about how mm -hmm. important vibration is and being able to tune into that. 
And so, yes, Evan definitely has uh, ideas on what's going on in the brain when listening to these. Yes, I was originally drawn to the technology because I realized this was intercepting consciousness at a very different level mm -hmm. from the way sound usually interfaces with consciousness. Mm -hmm. Most of our hearing of chants, anthems, hymns, whatever you you've heard is all processed in the acoustic cortex of the of the temporal lobe, which basically are circuits that he have evolved and modulated over the last one to 10 million years in primates and humans mm -hmm. in particular. Um, and yet uh, these binaural beats are going for a very different set of circuits. And there's a general principle in evolutionary biology that if you want to get to a deeper understanding of anatomy and function and all of that for any part of the human system, uh, go back in evolution and look at, at its origins. And so when we do that, what you find is the, the circuit that is actually being influenced by these binaural beats. And this is a phenomenon uh, discovered uh, in the mid 1800s mm. uh, by a Prussian physicist named Wilhelm Heinrich Dove. Uh, and he came up with this notion. And then in the 20th century, several investigators found uh, that binaural beats could greatly enhance uh, transmental states of conscious awareness. For example, Bob Monroe, but the Monroe Institute did a lot of work in out of body experiences mm -hmm. engendered by binaural beats. And likewise, others who were active in remote viewing in the psychic spy programs found that they could enhance their performance using binaural beats. And so I knew that there was this kind of background to it all. Um, but, uh, and I knew theoretically that uh, we were going for the circuit lower brainstem, that in fact, uh, that circuit that generates that wavering sensation, binaural beats, arose more than 300 million years ago. So it's a very ancient circuit uh, in an evolutionary neurobiology standpoint. And I think that explains a lot of the tremendous power it seems to have in liberating consciousness from the confines of the here and now. Once you realize, and this is something we discuss in great detail in our most recent book, which is Living in a Mindful Universe, mm -hmm. um, what you find is that uh, these um, uh, getting into these different states using binaural beats can uh, uh, explore consciousness richly. And I would say the model that's coming to the scientific community that we explain in that book, and that people can also learn about at my website, evanalexander.com and on sacredacoustics.com, uh, Karen's website, um, is all about uh, the notion of consciousness as something fundamental in the universe. And, and so, we could, uh, go ahead. Uh, but essentially my point is that these meditations allow you to traverse that veil, uh, to get out of this kind of limited notion of consciousness that's filtered into our brain by the, filtered into our awareness by the physical brain, and we can traverse that and get out into those levels of primordial mind that so, in many ways so, so let me are just the see. Let me just see if I understand. Um, so you're saying that our anatomy and our, our brains are basically uh, wired for these kind of altered or transcendent experiences. And with your near-death experience, you went into that. You, you um, whatever, activated that system, but you're finding that there's other ways, with, which is one of them is with the, uh, the acoustics that you're using. That's a way that people can activate that system and have a uh, transcendent or altered experience. Is that it's actually it's actually not activating a system in the brain. It's actually quieting the brain down and I moving see. it out of the way because the brain functions uh, as a, a filter uh, to it sort of right, I see. To allow us to perceive I our see. environment. Yeah, so but it's this, shutting down the brain traffic so that yeah. that system can be paid attention to. Oh, okay. Right. You gotta remember the linguistic brain, that little voice in our head, the annoying roommate, as Michael Singer puts it. Uh, is something that I very intentionally uh, displace in my meditative adventures. Now, I use that linguistic brain, you know, the voice of the ego, to make a request, state an intention at the very beginning of a meditation, but then that little uh, system of thought generation goes into timeout. You know, mm -hmm. so many of us identify with our thoughts, yes. you know, this running stream of consciousness as who we are. Yes. And that is not the case, and yes. that is not our consciousness. That's yes. the other thing is... Our consciousness is the awareness of that running stream, but that awareness can expand tremendously beyond the confines of the ego and this teeny little sense of self and here and now. Uh, and that's the kind of exploration we're talking about is uniting with that primordial mind by traversing the veil. And I think the most important lesson for your listeners is although I've used 
binaural beats. I use them an hour to a day. I've done that for 10 years plus. Uh, and I use them to return to my NDE. And I've developed a very rich relationship with uh, the various uh, uh, entities and, and forces and that incredible healing God force in my NDE. I've used my uh, tones to do that. But the bottom line is I've seen evidence in Karen and in hundreds of our workshop participants who have never had an NDE that they can get the same kind of value uh, of uniting with that, that one mind, that primordial force of love, that you don't need an NDE to get this. Yes. A dedicated program of conscious exploration with appropriate tools can get you there. And so, so your work together is you're, you're working with groups. So you're, you're, when, you're, when someone comes to a workshop, you, they, you play this, I don't know what to call it, there's acoustics, and then the group is invited or uh, can have this experience. Do you also work individually with people? Well, you, yes, you describe how we work in workshop settings where mm -hmm. it's a combination of lecture, Q&A, and then yes, we play the recordings for the group and then we get their responses right there in that moment, what they experienced. And it usually turns into quite a lively discussion, all the many different experiences people have. But it's also possible to just acquire these recordings and listen at home, at your own leisure. There's no reason to have us uh, involved on a regular basis. This is something people can do on their own in a self-paced kind of environment. But we've also uh, recently put together a brand new uh, program that Evan and I, along with a psychiatrist in New York created, titled Spirituality and Mental Health. And it's based on a pilot study that Dr. Yusum, the psychiatrist in New York performed using our recordings and she found in her practice a 26% reduction in anxiety. Mm. And so while Evan talks and we talk often about these spiritual adventures that are quite possible, many of us need to just remove ourselves from, you know, stressful situations and learn how to quiet the mind and learn how to, you know, release these blocked emotions and get in touch with that part of us that's not the physical. And so it's very important to bring this message to the mental community, to the medical community, especially in the mental health kind of realm, because they're used to prescribing and treating people for biological, psychological, and social types of things, but not spiritual. Mm -hmm. And by spiritual, we really agree most definitely with the Edgar Casey teachings, because we're not hung up on spirituality being a specific religion. Spiritual, acknowledging spirituality is merely acknowledging that there's something more beyond this physical world, something beyond our, our physical bodies. And I'll tell you that beliefs, our beliefs, there's nothing physical about our beliefs. Our beliefs mm -hmm. are considered in our lexicon a spiritual concept. And so Evan can share very much how important our beliefs are when it comes to healing and really in any situation. And our medical community has kind of taken the spiritual out of it and thinking that we can treat and diagnose and all the causes come from these other types of things. So we really wanna bring the spiritual back into people's lives mm -hmm. in a meaningful way, but a secular way. So it seems like the work that you're doing together is really trying to help people wake up, like kind of introduce themselves to whatever you want to call it, how much more there is to them than just their little physical consciousness or their little ego self. You're kind of introducing them to what I would call their soul consciousness. Is that well, is exactly? That a Eben, Eben had an amazing, what we call spiritually transformative experience where something in the spiritual realm beyond the physical affected him so much that it changed his whole outlook on life. And so that, is an example of what can happen. And in my own experience, taking time to develop what I call that inner world, that the, our thoughts, our beliefs, our emotions, taking time to learn how to manage all of that can really, when you start to pay attention to these types of things, can really start to transform all kinds of people's lives. It doesn't need to be something uh, grand and you know, weeks or months long, it can be a few moments that can be quite transformative, wouldn't you agree? Absolutely, yeah. and I think that's, uh, you all are making some wonderful points about beliefs in our culture. Uh, you know, and many of our beliefs uh, kind of trickle down from our scientific community. The scientific community is very kind of flummoxed and confused these days over the nature of consciousness itself. In mm -hmm. fact, 
many people believe it's the deepest and most profound question uh, facing science today is the very nature of consciousness. And anyone who thinks neuroscience is close to explaining it couldn't be further from the truth. But the important thing is to remember that most of what our society says about beliefs of human capabilities are falsely limiting. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they actually defer to the kind of theoretical limitations of the materialist model. If brain is creating consciousness, yes. Uh, yes. you know, yeah. then uh, we're, we're stuck here in this little local uh, brain to try and figure things out. But uh, the evidence from many leading scientific groups around the world is that things like non-local consciousness are absolutely real. Well, I uh, think, telepathy, um, for example. Well, um, when you, when you, one of the, one of the, you, the, just want to interrupt the, what always stays with me from one of your lectures was when you talked about how, uh, when we watch television, the, the, the scientific community, or some of us think that consciousness, the broadcast is happening in the television, which right. would be like there's a little man in there, or a you know, person in there, rather than realizing that's receiving a broadcast. I always found that very helpful to realize that our, that our brain is in a way receiving, the consciousness is not just in here, but it's right. something that we can tap into the, the similar way that a radio or television would. In, in fact, in our book, in Living in a Mindful Universe, we go into detail about the evidence that memory is not even stored in the brain. Yes. And of course, uh, you know, that is an absolute nail in the coffin of materialist neuroscience. That's why you don't hear it discussed much. And yet neurosurgeons have observed for decades that in spite of all the brain resections we've done, all the neocortical regions that have been resected um, and other parts of brain too, there's never been a case where great swathes of long-term memories disappeared with a certain brain operation. Now, it is true that if you uh, operate in near the medial temporal lobes, hippocampus, interrhinal cortex, those areas, especially if there's a reason for bilateral damage, you can greatly interfere with the conversion of short-term to long-term memory. But that's totally different yes. from finding where memories live. And yes, Wilder Penfield is a neurosurgeon who did all this work. He wrote a book in... 1975 mystery of the mind he made it very clear uh you know that memory was not anywhere he was looking in the in the neocortex etc and in fact i'd say the more recent evidence especially uh when you look at the broad scientific support for uh, for reincarnation say the work at uva with more than 2500 mm -hmm. past life memories in children suggested for reincarnation it's become very clear to everybody that memory and consciousness are not resident or derivative from any physical structure like yes. the brain it's the almost like the, the cloud. cloud. Like when we think of our, we're storing things in the cloud, it's kind of like our brain has a, there's a cloud. And I guess like in my work, you know, Edgar Casey talked about the Akashic records. He talked mm -hmm. about how our past lives are recorded in this Akashic record. And I've started to believe that even in this life, our memories are, are recorded in, a, in, a, in the Akashic record, but it's more that we, we feel that that's real. And then when you, you have to kind of suspend your disbelief to go in to believe that you have an Akashic record, it's stored in the same sort of way about your past lives and your past experiences. Well, that's very true. And in that context, I would simply point out the phenomenon of terminal lucidity. This is something that many hospice workers, nurses who work with those who are uh, uh, terminal patients, mm -hmm. et cetera, see fairly frequently. Uh, and I've heard of cases even where this occurred in people who had been in coma for weeks or months due to their brain being almost completely displaced by metastatic cancer. And yet that patient would wake up as they approach death, be very, uh, uh, have memories and conversation with loved ones at the bedside there. It's often, often occurs at a time when they see loved ones who've left the physical world, whose souls are coming there to escort them over. Yes. And so some, uh, kind of neophytes to the hospice world might call that a terminal delusion. Mm -hmm. But the reality mm -hmm. is those encounters uh, with souls of departed loved ones are actually an imprimatur that prove the authenticity of the experience. Mm -hmm. But you cannot explain terminal lucidity with any kind of materialist, you know, brain creates mind thinking because all those episodes of terminal lucidity, which are estimated to occur in five to 10% of Alzheimer's patients, uh, are stunning counterexamples to the materialist uh, paradigm. And it's one of the many, many reasons why we need to throw the materialist paradigm of brain creates mind out because it's false and it doesn't help yeah. in understanding human experience. Now, now do you, do you uh, Dr. Alexander, do you believe that 
in the big picture of things that in some ways you were uh, selected to have this experience because you know you're you're so articulate and knowledgeable in the scientific realm it's like it's hard you know for a person uh, let's say if i say something you know it's one thing but if you as a person with your background it's almost like you can't be taken lightly like you your your knowledge and the the, the language that you use is interfacing th those who in the scientific community either either have to deny you know like like they often do or they have to listen do you feel that well, that I was somehow uh, you know, not, not just by chance. Well, I don't think anything is by chance. Yes. I think all of this is a, a program pattern of awakening for humanity. I mm -hmm. think it's part of human destiny. Um, and, you know, the reality is if I'd been a truck driver and I had the experience I had, it would have changed my life and been an astonishing experience. And the one thing that many people don't realize is the, the, uh, the icing on the cake is my recovery. There's a case report on my medical records that came out in Journal of Nervous and Mental Diseases in September 2018. Um, and that case report made by three physicians who are not involved in my care, but who are fascinated by my extraordinary, uh, miraculous recovery that defies anything known in Western medicine. Yeah. That's why they wrote it up. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, the interesting thing is that recovery uh, is an extreme challenge to anyone yes. who's trying to explain my case. And, it, and um, if you had been a if you had been a truck driver, I don't think you would have understood it the way you do as a well, that, as a that's doctor. That's the issue. Is my doctors would have told me if I was a truck driver, just as my doctors told me when yeah. I was coming back. And I'll tell you, when I woke up from that coma, all of my knowledge of neuroscience, all my personal memories of Evan Alexander's life were gone. They were deleted by the experience itself. It's one of the unique features of my experience was my amnesia for the life of Evan Alexander. I didn't have any words or language. All that was gone, but that empty slate was crucial for the journey that I was mm. to go on. But the interesting thing is when I tried to tell my doctors about my experience, they would pat me on the back. Oh yes, your brain was full of pus. In fact, we can't understand how you're even here putting two words together, much less like real conversation. I mean, mm. my recovery was a tremendous shock uh, to my doctors. Now, if I'd just been that truck driver, um, I wouldn't have reviewed my medical right. records and realized the extent of damage to my neocortex showing up, yes. up on MRI and CT scan. I wouldn't have been able to interpret uh, what a, a Glasgow coma scale of, you know, between five and seven throughout that whole week where anything below nine is deep coma. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have been able to figure out what all that meant. Yes. So I would have just said, oh, my doctors are right. Dying brain pulls all kinds of tricks and walk right. away from it. But the issue is I am a neurosurgeon. All those memories and neurosurgical knowledge did come back over about two months. And of course, as I started reading the NDE literature, which I'd never read before my coma, mm -hmm. I was shocked by the similarities of my experience to so many others, going back thousands of years across all cultures, all religions, including a lot of atheists and agnostics mm -hmm. who have these profound experiences that show them the spiritual nature of the universe. Mm -hmm. And so in essence, yes, it was important that I was a neurosurgeon, but uh, it's not like you know being chosen for it, it because all of these journeys uh, without fail are a lesson for the individual soul. And it just yes. so happens that my individual soul lesson as a neurosurgeon fascinated by consciousness to go into this deep coma that should have killed me uh, and then with a 2% chance of survival but no expectation for recovery to then come back and have a complete recovery demands some explanation. Yes, I think that's the part that's um, perhaps more unique about the, the 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 person that you were before you had the experience, and it's almost like your process of awakening is some of what you're you're presenting to the scientific community that that your your knowledge and your experience in some ways um, contradicts or makes uh, the scientific community have to to think about things perhaps in a different way. But um, Karen, I'd like to shift over to you. What got? I mean, I know with Eben, his his near death experience is kind of what awoke him to this. How about for you? How did you get into doing what you do? Well, for me, it was just a lifelong curiosity. I wanted the answers to those big questions. Why are we here and what is our purpose? Mm -hmm. And so I, as I was going through life, uh, those answers were not readily available, as anyone can tell you. But I thought that science might be able to answer them, that maybe religion could potentially answer those kind of questions. And that wasn't the case. And so as I you know, grew up into an adult and, you know, did everything everyone else does, went to college, got a job, raised mm -hmm. a, a daughter and all of that. 
I was still insatiably curious. And so I didn't have a big catalyst moment like many do, maybe the loss of a loved one and illness mm -hmm. or, or some tragedy, some hardship often sends people into these types of uh, seeking uh, behaviors. But I just wanted to know the truth. I am a big seeker of truth. And so when I was dissatisfied with science and religion, I turned to other texts, other type of spiritual texts, esoteric texts. Certainly the KC readings were part of my interest along mm -hmm. with uh, Kabbalah and uh, theosophy and uh, other types of material. And when I read this material, it's not like it is in the academic world where you need to have a source, a reliable source, and you need to uh, prove somehow that these things are true before you can really believe them. What I came to find is that I could really just feel into something if it felt true to me or not. And I know to many uh, secular kind of people that just doesn't make any sense. They just mm -hmm. think, oh, we're just making it up. But it is absolutely true when people take time to slow down, to feel into who they really are, it, you start to feel a different resonance when you're with a topic or subject that just is completely just not true. Mm -hmm. And so all of us will have a sort of a slightly different type of what I call truth meter. Uh, but that's what I was after. I was after truth. And so I learned that we can all be telepathic. I learned mm -hmm. we can all develop our intuition, that, that we can heal ourselves. And so I learned many, many modalities for doing all of these different things. And what I found was that going through this process actually ended up being a spiritually transformative experience because you can't start yeah. running into, oh, here, I want to learn how to be telepathic without running into your limiting belief systems, mm -hmm. without running into emotional blockages that are preventing you from accessing that type of information. So I started uh, realizing I had all kinds of little, what I call baby wounds, sort of things that happened when I was very young before I really understood the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. And I realized that all of us do this. We make decisions when we're very, very young and we create these situations for ourselves. I'll give you just one quick example. When my parents were divorced, uh, when I was seven years old, me and my two brothers, we mm -hmm. were all asked who we would like to live with. And oh. I chose my mother oh, very difficult. strongly. My father had been in Vietnam. He mm -hmm. had been in the war for two years. I didn't feel like I knew him. And so I rejected my father. I decided I didn't need him. Mm -hmm. In fact, I didn't need any man to take care of me. Mm -hmm. And so what this ended up doing was creating a very independent sort of spirit. And I am very self-sufficient, but it made it more challenging to enter into relationship. Mm -hmm. And so discovering these little kind of things that happen yeah. can, can take place when you take time to go within, when you develop techniques of understanding maybe your underlying motivations for certain behaviors. And so this is what brought me there. It was really just an undying curiosity and a commitment to developing this greater part of myself. I, I, I hesitate to label that as anything, but you could call it a soul. Mm -hmm. You could call it a higher self. You could just call yeah. it, you know, uh, a that light which body. doesn't have I, a name, right? Yes. Yeah. And so I, I, you know, I'm sure you run into this trouble when you present these types of concepts. The language that you use, many people assume you come from a certain lineage. Yes. And my lineage is everything. Yes. I studied, you know, all the esoteric stuff, all, all many, many things. And uh, I find the common truths, the universal truths. And these are the things that we can move, move forward with. I've also been very inspired by the work of HeartMath, which does mm -hmm. have a physical sort of uh, hook to it. And mm -hmm. what they do is they study the electromagnetic field of the heart. And once you realize that that electromagnetic field is affected by your thoughts and emotions, and actually influences people around you, then you can really start to reckon with what am I bringing to this world? What mm -hmm. am I contributing to this world with my thoughts and my emotions? And so all of this kind of really contributed to my personal awakening, not one specific event like Eben, but it was very much yes. cultivated. An evolution. And I, yes, I had mm -hmm. a very hard time with meditation in the beginning, like so many. Mm -hmm. and. If I can do it, anyone can do this. You can get to this level of knowledge just through persistence and commitment. Yeah. 
you know, as, as we're having this conversation, it's um, highlighting for me, you know, I, I do, um, well, I started off doing past life regressions probably, I don't know, 15 years ago. And I found that that was really only five years. After about five years in, people started having much different experiences. And I think it's more like what you're describing where people move into kind of a soul consciousness where they contact their guides and they have a much broader connection to, uh, to spirit or soul, whatever you want to call it. And I, as I'm thinking about, you know, that we're supposedly in the new age versus the previous age, you know, it seemed that the spiritual teachers in the past with Jesus or Buddha, there was a lot of lecturing. You know, there wasn't so much getting the mystical connection. And maybe consciousness wasn't ready at that time. But it seems that now more and more people and colleagues that I talk about is that is that the new spirituality is really not the church outside of yourself, it's the temple within. And I think that's right. what I'm hearing from you all is that you're you're helping people go into that inner temple and have their own mystical God experience. And I think that that's really what's transformative, not so much an intellectual understanding, but a, a actual experience. Yes, and that's exactly what I ran into when I would read all of this information, mm -hmm. looking for these answers. It was not until I actually began to generate personal experience that I started to feel like I was reaching some answers. And mm -hmm. of course, Eben would still be that neurosurgeon operating on brains, denying the reality of a soul, uh, unless he had had that experience. So rather than waiting around for that, we always say that you cannot understand consciousness just by talking about it. Exactly what you said, you must experience it. So that's absolutely what our goal is, is to bring the experience of this to as many individuals who are willing to give it a shot. Yeah, yeah I'd, I'd just like to add, personal experience is absolutely key. But a big reality I've come to realize is many people have questioned me over the years, you know, how, how has this changed your life? What about all your, you know, scientific colleagues, et cetera, is I want to make the point that the scientific evidence for non-local consciousness and the reality of soul uh, is all around us. Anyone who takes the time to uh, uh, study, to read the right books and come to a deeper understanding, the evidence for eternity of soul is right there, proven in a very strong scientific setting. It uh, requires opening one's mind. It does mm -hmm. require opening one's mind, but if, if you are willing to uh, you know, assess empirical data, mm -hmm. and if you're willing to follow a rational argument, yes. the evidence is already all yes. around you for the eternity of soul, the reality, not only the afterlife, but of reincarnation. And in fact, I often go on record as saying by the year 2028, no self-respecting, uh, intellectual, scientifically minded, well-read person on earth will doubt the reality, not only of the afterlife, but of reincarnation. Yes. Because the evidence is overwhelming once you start investigating. Yeah, and I think history, uh, I mean, science is a wonderful tool. Science itself is unbiased, but a lot of scientists are biased. And I think very. history is very much a show that, you know, if we'd only follow the science, but then sometimes there's a rejection of, of the results because it, it alters paradigms that are, that are fundamental for, for the ego in a way. Now you're referring to what's called scientism, <laughs> uh, which is a faith-based religious system that basically says the only knowledge that's worthy of acknowledging uh, is that gained through the scientific method. Uh, and I would remind you that um, uh, Richard Feynman, one of the most renowned uh, physicists of the 20th century, yes. uh, you know, one of the uh, great luminaries in quantum physics in the mid part of that century, uh, in his Nobel Prize acceptance speech, uh, said that there's a tremendous amount of deep truth that will never be uh, you know, proven. Uh, in other words, he realized there's a tremendous amount of knowledge, especially about things like consciousness, yes. that cannot be simply put down into this uh, yes, no binary, randomized controlled uh, uh, setup to give us the knowledge we're seeking. We really need to take anecdotes like the uh, millions of near-death experiences that had come on this planet uh, in the last uh, six decades, ever since uh, doctors developed techniques for cardiac resuscitation. We need to take that kind of information and take yeah. the lessons the universe is trying to give us there. Yes. Uh, and I think especially when you broaden your mind to uh, the scientific demonstration of non-local consciousness, for example, found in those beautiful books out of University of Virginia, Irreducible Mind and Beyond Physicalism, you start to realize the scientific revolution about the primacy of consciousness is already very well underway. Yes, and I, uh, I remember when, 
when Duke University had the Department of Parapsychology and they were putting uh, telepathy under rigorous scientific uh, method and controls and basically they were able to demonstrate that telepathy is real. But it's almost like those things have gotten, you know, they're, they're, they're scientific anomalies that really don't fit the existing paradigm, so they're kind of marginalized. You know, that's one thing that always frustrated me about science is that they eliminate the anomalies. <laughs> and I'm like, why aren't you studying the anomalies? That's where the answer they're, is. Yeah, right. they're very yeah. interested in what falls in the normal range, but it's what falls outside the normal range that interests me. And so to have that all dismissed is so interesting. Plus well, this idea maybe, we, of, maybe we haven't come that far from uh, from killing Galileo for <laughs> for pointing out. Yeah, as right. modern, exactly, as modern as we like to think we are, mm -hmm. because we've all rejected religion, you know, as, yes. oh, that's just not, not, uh, not all, but many have rejected religion. But I, I always comment on this concept of atheism. Atheism means you believe that God does not exist. If you say that, it's not a science, it's not very scientific to say that you know for sure you have proof that something doesn't exist. How can you even say that? It's the most anti-scientific, you know, statement to say that I'm atheist. Much better is to say that I'm agnostic mm -hmm. and that I don't really know the answer. So it really surprises me when these hardcore materialist scientists claim that atheism is is the way to go, because as Eben says, that's a faith based religion right. to it, believe it's in like faith. scientific fundamentalism exactly. I, I, would, I would like to add in that beautiful quote from werner heisenberg who won the nobel prize for his work as a founding father of quantum physics um and uh he i think that was in 1932 but heisenberg said that the first gulp from the glass of the natural sciences will lead you towards atheism but at the bottom of the glass god is waiting for you and and that has yes, everything to do with quote. quantum physics you know, yeah. those scientists today who claim, you know, when you die, you're dead, there's nothing left, you know, obviously are not incorporating quantum physics. Quantum physics opens the door to a tremendous amount of liberation, including free will, because materialist neuroscience would scoff at you for claiming to have any free will at all. And it's because they've completely uh, befuddled themselves over the measurement paradox in quantum physics and how to interpret it. Mm -hmm. And in essence, the, the, the quantum... Uh, scientific world has moved progressively towards a very profound conclusion now that really defends idealism as the way the entire universe works. That is, there's a mental layer of assimilation and integration of information, and that mental layer is one that humans have access to. But of course, the mistake they made in the old days was they said, well, the universe can't, there can't be a fundamental consciousness because it had to wait for human consciousness to evolve. False. We borrow this quality from the universe. That's mm -hmm. the point. And that's where, uh, as we explain in Living in a Mindful Universe, this concept of primordial mind, the brain is a filter, all of it starts to make far more sense. You return free will to the equation, you bring in the, the reality of reincarnation, and then we start getting into some very interesting territory about the nuts and bolts of how it all works. But essentially, we have a consilience, a um, a, an alignment of information both in the world of quantum physics and from neuroscience of consciousness and philosophy of mind, all leading us towards the primacy of mind in the universe, mm -hmm. which means when you die, what happens is not what the materialist neuroscientist would predict, which is your conscious awareness goes to zero as your brain snuffs out. But in fact, as the filter is removed, your conscious awareness expands tremendously. That's yes. what near-death experiences have been trying to tell us yes. for a long, long time. Yeah. Uh, and that is a beautiful gift. And that's where the meditation comes in so handy. Yes. Because you can uh, dedicate your life to getting these answers by exploring your own consciousness. Yes. and come to tremendous answers, yes. proving the reality and eternity of soul long before you ever face that issue, leaving your physical body once and for all. Um, well, we're, we're, we're going to wrap up, but there's one, one uh, last question I'd like to ask both of you is through the experiences and the work that you've done, how do you feel that it's changed you? I mean, for, uh, Dr. Alexander, I think for you, you had more of a, a, a single moment of awakening and, and Karen, your, yours has been more of an evolution over time. But how do you feel that, that this process of, I don't know what you call it, kind of soul awakening, what has that brought? How do you feel your life is different now than it was before that experience or that process? I, 
I, the important thing to point out is my NDE was a punctuation mark. It was not all the big answers, you know, delivered to me in an instant. Right. Uh, what happens is in, in an NDE is your your worldview gets shaken very dramatically. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I've spent the last 11 years since my coma trying to make sense of it. I feel like we've made tremendous progress. And that's actually what Karen and I do is share that progress because it empowers people tremendously. Uh, you know, the medical profession has honored placebo effect more than six decades as a gold standard. The placebo effect is nothing more than an admission that one's beliefs can greatly influence their healing. Yes. Uh, and so for me, this has been a tremendous awakening, 180 degree shift from who I was before, but it was really through meeting Karen and, and some of her wisdom and a lot of what we share and reveal in these workshops with all of our participants that to me has been so uh, rewarding mm -hmm. and uh, life changing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, you know, we're all evolving. It's hard for me to say the before and the after because we continue to evolve. Mm -hmm. We're all work in progress. But I would say the way that I've changed most fundamentally is just the level of authenticity that I that I bring. Um, where as maybe before, I'll just say before, I may have been holding myself back in certain areas, keeping my mouth shut, not wanting to make waves. Mm -hmm. And, and now I, I just come forth and, uh, you know, put it all out there. It, it, I'm less afraid to yeah. be different. Than That's a good word, the authenticity. Yeah. It helps you to yeah. be more your authentic self without the fear of the people not liking you or criticizing you. Well, yeah. and also finding my authentic purpose. Many mm -hmm. of us, when we start this path of seeking truth, we want to know what what is my purpose? and. That, that angst can really, it, I know it drove me for quite a long time. And when I finally realized, and you have to realize this by experiencing it, not by changing your mind in your head, but when I finally realized that being that soul that I came here to be, that authentic self was my purpose, yes. that's when things really started to settle down. Yes. But in the beginning, that answer is not very satisfying. And yet you need to go through that process and eventually that's where you find yourself. And I love the work you do, the past life regression, because I have found that myself, one of the modalities that was very helpful in addition to my own uh, using sound to explore within consciousness was having a facilitator help me get into those same types of states and sort of guide me through things that I may have kind of avoided on my own yes. or, or not gone as deeply with. And so. I'm a big uh, fan of many different modalities working together in unique ways for whatever that particular person's needs may be. Yeah, what I, what your, 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 your answer is reminding me, I remember a teacher one time said that a lot of people are driving with the brakes on. And so it's almost <laughs> like you, 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 you get the, you stop, you can go a lot further without pressing the brakes while you're trying to that, go That's a beautiful analogy, but yeah. I, I think these are beautiful points and it really has to do with uh, coming into your authentic self. I mean, all mm -hmm. of us came to this world to accomplish something, to bring something uh, to the world. Uh, and uh, this is a way of discovering what that is yes. and then beginning to really live it. It gives you the power to manifest that free will of the higher soul. Yes. To really bring that change to the world that that, uh, that you desire. And, and yeah. we envision a far, far uh, more beautiful and harmonious world that I believe is truly within our reach. But it does demand this kind of awakening that we're talking about. And it's so interesting. You reminded me of a, a new concept for me that I just learned in the process of creating this course with uh, psychiatrist, Dr. Anna Yusum. And she uses a term spiritual bypass, which is uh, mm -hmm. really, you know, people, what I learned and I've, I've seen this all the time and I'm potentially guilty of it myself, but I didn't know there was a term for it. And what it means is that you can talk all the spirit you want, oh, love and light and, and good, but if you're avoiding your shadow side or your, uh, you know, if, if you're not reckoning with that part of you that is potentially causing you issues yes. or whatever it may be, you're really doing a spiritual bypass. The yes. spiritual work really involves going deep within and uncovering those yes. kind of uncomfortable things, but there's no way out but through. Once you yeah. get through that uncomfortableness, oh my gosh, the other side is just inex inexplain unexplainable until you experience it yourself. Yeah, we're, we're living in a time where there's a lot of shadow projection. And I think mm. the more a people- A tremendous just, amount. Yeah. Fact, it's almost like a complete shadow world. Yes. Yeah. And the more but we, I think that we that's do that. 
that's an that's an energy that can drive a tremendous benefit. Yes, it's like the gift of desperation in uh, addiction studies, well, and we're uh, bouncing off that bottom. Now, one of the, the thinking with Edgar Casey's uh, philosophy, it's very similar. He talked about in a way that we're we're all like seeds. You know, we're like a, a seed of an elm or seed of an oak. And what happens is sometimes an oak is raised by elms, and then the oak is a lousy elm. And at some point, the oak has to say, you know what? I've got to. I'd rather be a, you know the oak than a lousy elm. And so it's that I process of that. beautiful. That's really nice. Yeah. I love that analogy of the seed. So that's a Casey analogy. Yes. Mm -hmm. it's All a, right. Well, that, I'll attribute him if we use that. Please yeah, do. Yeah, that's a cool example. That. Please yeah. do. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Sure thing. Great. Well, I really enjoyed our conversation, and I'm so glad that you're uh, going to be uh, here. Uh, at ARE and sharing this experience and, and just being part of really the intention of Edgar Casey of us uh, awakening to spirit and bringing, uh, you know, birthing this new age that hopefully we can start seeing each other as brothers and sisters and treating each other like family. So that would be, thank you for, uh, for being part of this process and your wonderful work. I well, really and thank you for being part of that pioneering energy that built this path for us yeah. to kind of join. Thank sure you. Sure thing. Thank, thank you. you. Very much. Thank you. Great well, talking with you. Thanks for having us on. Sure thing. Really enjoyed our conversation. Look forward to seeing you again soon. All right. Bye-bye. Enjoy your day. You too.